Do I have audio? I do. I think. Good morning. All right. I was foolish enough to install an update, so it took me another sec to get this reconnected. I'm going to go without a monitor. Hopefully that works okay. And I'm going to close the door. Keep it handy. I think so. I'm gonna fix my view. I'm not super happy with the lighting. All right, that's not what you're here for. Last time we went through the beginning of chapter six, looking at the classification of viruses. What are viruses? Let's roll back a little bit. Um, a little basics on the transmission of disease and what I didn't fill in there before we called it a day was the International Union of Microbial Societies, which uh, their virology division is tasked with classifying viruses. Let's see if this site is up now. Oops, we have divisions. this now and let's see if we have virology okay it's not me they're just down so this is the group that are assigning more traditional nomenclature to viruses by orders and families even though they're not uh, specifically living as such Here's an alternative classification method called the Baltimore classification. And here we go. This is where I want to be. This classifies viruses based on their physical characters, which includes whether or not they have, well, first of all, DNA or RNA, because they never have both whether it's single-stranded or double-stranded. RNA can be double-stranded under the right circumstances. And then whether it is plus or minus stranded, which is, applies here uh, to the here's negative single-stranded RNA. And that is relative to whether or not it has to be uh, transcribed a second time in order to be translated or if it can be translated directly. So again, this is uh, based on physical characters rather than a traditional uh, genus species approach. So I, I kind of favor the Baltimore classification, being honest. Some common viruses that it's good to know some of these things about. So 
see here we, we we're still using family names with examples of viruses but we're looking at uh, the character of the genome whether it's enveloped or naked or plus single-stranded RNA so that can be directly translated into proteins as examples here so we have the herpes viridia family including the simplex virus and uh, that's you know herpes the herpes viruses which is super common and we have the papilloma uh, papilloma viridia and again that's if it's a family the suffix is viridia and if it's in uh, a specific example of a virus it's the suffix is virus that's pretty straightforward and what other fun is here rotavirus that's yeah rhinovirus a common cold is represented by a lot of different members of the rhinovirus group of course hepatitis and yeah whatnot here's another example of some plus single-stranded RNA enveloped viruses which includes rubella and AIDS and then negative sense single-stranded RNA we have our Ebola virus influenza and rabies this is in I did a new recording for the reading and that is available in canvas and here on this channel okay so the World Health Organization works with the International Classification of Disease. Let's see, ICD-11 is here. So this is where the, the World Health Organization has a coding system for everything. And here is the uh, specific classification code scheme for disease. All right, so part two. David's doctor, let's see, he got early symptoms of rabies. I think I went over this. Took a biopsy, a bunch of hair follicles, and blood test came back positive. Uh, he does appear to have rabies virus antigen present. So the doctor prescribes prophylactic treatment and uh, you get this rabies shots, right? So this is human rabies immunoglobulins, basically serum, which is the same kind of thing as antivenin, where you're using uh, antibodies generated. In this case, well, I'm not sure how this immunoglobulin is generated. I should look that up. But um, with antivenin, a lot of times it's horses that the antibodies are generated within, which is why, for example, Dr. Zimmer has refused antivenin in the past and the well at least the one time I know of for sure he got envenomated because some people have a severe reaction to the horse serum okay so section two the viral life cycle we will look at that I'm just gonna keep calling it a life cycle whatever so what's important to learn out of this section is the uh, differences between the lytic and the lysogenic life cycle. Those are popular questions to ask and um, in future contexts too. You're going to figure out that in your graduate programs, well, I can't speak to those of you going to uh, into a professional program, but at least if you're going to go into a science graduate program um, a lot of the things you're going to be questioned on are things you're learning at this level at the undergraduate level so it's good to have your basics kind of cemented in and that makes all the graduate courses a lot easier because conceptually there's not a whole lot new there it's just that when we say if we hand wave about all the accessory proteins and, and DNA replication, you don't hand wave it. You have to know a bunch of them for a while. But you're just adding levels of detail. So you already have this scaffolding built now, ideally. Or you're building your scaffolding now, and then you just hang stuff on it. I saw some people in a Masters of Health uh, Policy MHP program. They were required to take a molecular biology course and they'd never had molecular biology in their life so 
I think they get through it okay, but it was definitely a struggle. All right, so you're also going to be able to describe the replication process of animal viruses, unique characteristics of retroviruses and latent viruses, human viruses and their virus host cell interactions, explain transduction, and describe the replication pro process of plant viruses. I don't know why that in there. Anyway, some basic terminology. Again, if you life cycle, just forget this up here, biocycle, blah, blah, blah. So uh, two different kinds of phages. We're looking at bacteriophages. So these are viruses that are specialized uh, to use bacteria as hosts and exclusively utilize bacteria. And they're generally restricted to uh, one genera or a very tight group of genera. So phages can be virulent or temperate. And virulent phages immediately go into uh, the lytic cycle and they, uh, this results in death to the host cell, releasing a, a, a lot of new virons, so released viral particles. The temperate phages, on the other hand, can become latent and cause a chronic infection to the host cell, but they can also go lytic, become lytic. And this is called lysogeny when they go temperate or become integrated into the host chromosome. And when that phage becomes integrated into the host chromosome, we call it a prophage. And a bacteria hosting a prophage is a lysogen. And sometimes this comes with increased toxicity because that prophage will bring um, genes that are capable of conferring increased virulence. And then induction is the process of excising the viral genome from the host. Okay, so let's look at the lytic cycle and the bacteriophage. There we go. So first step is attachment. The phage has to have a way to attach to the surface. It'll use these fibers here and these tail pins here. And then following that attachment, uh, penetration, where it essentially injects its DNA into the host cell. At this point, the uh, biosynthesis begins. So the phage DNA replicates, phage proteins are made and then the uh, maturation, new phage particles are assembled and the viral genome is packaged. Then following that is lysis, the cell lysis, releasing the newly made phages. So again, a virulent phage only engages in the lytic cycle, as indicated here. So lysogeny, the lysogenic cycle, we have attachment, we have penetration. However, following penetration, we have uh, the incorporation of phage DNA into the host genome becoming a prophage. And then whenever the cell divides from then on out until excision, the uh, cell will be copying the virus along with itself. And Generally, uh, excision and entrance into the lytic cycle is based on a stress-induced response. So our neighbor's having a lot of problem with their car alarm. It went off like four times yesterday. Of course, I was to go double check and make sure it's not ours. I don't think that was ours. Mine. I really want to find... I need to take this apart and disable that freaking alarm, at least for me. I don't need that. Okay, so a temperate bacteriophage has, so, sorry, the lysogenic cycle, the lysogenic portion is simply integration of the phage's DNA into the host genome, at which time it can go generations in this stage as a prophage. And sometimes, yeah, I might as well mention this now. 
sometimes there will be errors that will result in the prophage being unable to be excised and this bit of DNA will stay in there forever. So it could be conferring some new metabolic capacity, could have disrupted a gene when it got inserted and whatnot. So, you know, that could be an ongoing change. And this is thought to be the source of transposons, of jumping genes. They were originally uh, integrated viruses, transposable elements. All right, so if we've gone into the lytic cycle, it's the same thing. You replicate the phage proteins, you know, go through assembly and packaging, and then lysis. But yeah, starvation or any kind of stresses. And that's said to be true of a lot of human diseases that rely on um, retroviruses as well, that stress on the host will induce um, viruses to be released make new or make new virons explode from the host cell and infect other cells so the process of transduction so sometimes uh, this is essentially the well this part of this is lysogeny but attachment penetration integration into the host excision so sometimes when the phage is excised there is a small piece of the host dna that gets excised with the viral dna and uh, becomes packaged into the capsid of the virus so now this new phage is carrying this uh, some of its host code into a new cell so now this new phage that's carrying both viral and bacterial dna infects a new host uh, the, there we go the dna undergoes recombination in the new cell and uh, you know becomes incorporated that way so this is specialized transduction and it's specialized because there's a specific uh, insertion point that the phage will get inserted to in the new cell Um, and it would be based on that recombination will be based on the homology of the bacterial segments that are attached to the virus. So overall, definition of transduction is the transfer of bacterial DNA from a, one bacterium to another that's mediated by viral infection. So there's the generalized version, which is just uh, based on the lytic cycle, sometimes during all that. Uh, reproduction and packaging and everything some bacterial chromosome will get packaged or specialized and it's based on specific insertion site sequences so yeah that's transduction so viruses with an animal host in this picture okay that's not great in this picture we have a uh, influenza virus cartoon binding to the surface of an epithelial cell so let's see it binds and the cell engulfs the virus by endocytosis the virus is uncoded so we have attachment penetration uncoding biosynthesis so the viral rna enters the nucleus where it is replicated by the viral rna polymerase new phage particles are assembled and then release uh, the cell uh, may not be killed in this process um, so lysis isn't the automatic fate and that cell could persist for a while uh, creating new virons and re creating and releasing new virons there is a feature of the immune system that can help identify the cells that are doing this and tag them for destruction and we'll get into that later in the semester for sure. So it's the viral glycoproteins that are able to attach to the host epithelial cell and that induces endocytosis. And then the viral RNA and viral proteins are made into new virons that are released by budding. So tissue tropism is a term used to describe a host cell type specificity and 
the tissue tropism involved with influenza tends to be epithelial cells. Okay, now looking at viral RNA dependent RNA polymerase. There we are. Okay, anything special here on top of what I'm already going to say. So again, if it's a negative, uh, I don't know, negative sense, negative single stranded RNA, it will have to be turned into plus positive RNA in order to be translated by host ribosomes. And that conversion is accomplished by the viral, the RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So it's an RNA polymerase that is specialized in translating RNA. So let's see RNA devices. Yeah, plus. Yeah. So again, this works as a template to produce this RNA, which the host ribosomes can be tricked into translating, producing viral proteins. So HIV, here's a cartoon of how this works. So HIV utilizes GP120 to bind with CD4, and that induces Let's see, reverse transcriptase, integrase, other viral proteins are able to enter the host cell. The viral DNA is formed by reverse transcription. So this is reverse transcriptase. The viral DNA is transported across the nucleus. It gets integrated into the host DNA. And then the new viral RNA is used as genomic RNA to make viral proteins and then the virus is able to mature and be released. So this is where we introduce the retrovirus. Oops. And well, latent infections goes right along with that. So the viral contents, yeah, enzymes. Yeah. So reverse transcriptase, the enzyme that's able to buck the um, central dogma of molecular biology, I guess, where information flow is supposed to be DNA to RNA to protein. Well, here we're able to go from RNA back to DNA. And that is what a retrovirus is capable of doing. And sometimes these retroviruses, uh, like in the um, example with phages, are unable to um, become excised later on. Well, that's not what these guys are doing. These are making RNA. But the ability to make that RNA can get impaired or destroyed. So we can carry around these viral fragments um, for uh, generations. So latent infections, uh, hopefully most of you got your chicken pox vaccine. That came on the market about 1994-ish. Um, I had chicken pox. So the, I have this varicella zoster, which is a member of herpes viridia living in my basal ganglia cells for the rest of my life as far as we know right uh, let's see double-stranded dna genome becomes incorporated into the host dna and it forms this latent infection i was in let's see i lived in mayfield in that trailer park and went to lowe's so third or fourth grade somewhere in there uh, i went through this for uh, like a week it's pretty awful anyway hopefully you haven't had that experience and you've had this vaccine so you won't have that experience i know my kids have been spared that in fact this later this afternoon i'm going to take two of them for their well child check and we're going to talk about some other vaccines like the uh, hpv vaccine starting that series because they're getting older all right, so the viral growth curve, this is gonna look familiar in the next chapter we go through, which will be chapter nine. I might pit stop through seven and eight, but I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time there because you're gonna get that if you haven't already gotten it uh, from some of your chemistry classes and genetics and any other cell or molecular biology. I don't wanna, there's a few things I wanna highlight, but I don't wanna spend a lot of time there. Anyway, here, uh, this uh, in chapter nine, you'll see bacterial growth curves that kind of look like this. 
a little bit. Uh, it's the same trend. So we're looking at a logarithmic scale of the number of infectious virons. And so after you inoculate your bacterial culture, we'll say we're looking at bacterial culture here. Well, it doesn't say that. It can be anything, any or animal cells, plant cells, whatever. So the number of virons available in solution goes down initially because they're attaching. Um, here's the eclipse phase where the virons penetrate the cells. And then we're looking at a lytic cycle where you have the burst stage where um, many viral particles are released up to a maximal burst size, number of virons released per bacterium. There's an ultimate limit, right? Because you only have so many cells available. Oops, okay. So let's look at the Sigma Xi ethics section. So during Ebola, uh, the we got the 2014 outbreak that was uh, 10,179 people died. That was out of uh, nearly 25,000 suspected or confirmed cases. There are no approved treatments or vaccines for Ebola yet. Wait, let me make sure there hasn't been something published super recently. Which is fun. Okay, what stage is that one in? So this is good to know. And it, okay, you know what, fine, it's Wikipedia. Wikipedia is kind of good for a lot of general information stuff now. We used to poo-poo it a lot in the sciences, uh, say 10, 12 years ago, but we're further down the road now, right? So here is the RVSV Zbov vaccine. Uh, let's see, April 2017, somewhat effective, oh, efficacy is not great. Recombinant replication, competent vaccine. Okay, so we have the vesicular stomatitis virus, genetically engineered to express a glycoprotein from the Ebola virus so as to provoke a neutralizing immune response. Nice. It was used in the 2018 outbreak. And let's see, somewhat effective. Looks like a... So where are we at with it now is what I'm looking for. Oh, whoops. What? So we have National Academy of Medicine publishing review or selected. So this isn't like on the market. Okay, anyway, there is a vaccine in the works, I guess. Okay, but it's not widely distributed and with high efficacy or whatever. Sorry, just double check myself there. All right, so anyway, um, in 2014, we had a couple of infected U.S. aid workers and a Spanish priest. They were treated with ZMAP. It's an unregistered drug that had been tested in monkeys, but not in humans. The two American aid workers recovered, but the priest died. And then uh, later that month, WHO released a report on the ethics of treating patients with the drug. Since Ebola is often fatal, the panel reasoned that it is ethical to give the unregistered drugs an unethical to withhold them for safety concerns. So this was an example of, so the use of ZMAP uh, is an example of compassionate use outside the well-established system of regulation and governance of therapy. So mortality rate being as high as it is, wait, I should just, I forgot what the mortality rate was, 50%. That's a coin flip. If you have something that has a chance at helping you survive, uh, why not? Well, the measles situation in Washington State continues to grow. So there's plenty of people saying, where should I? 
All right, anyway. Let's see. Here's a little figure that went with it. They are... working at BSL 3. That hood's not really great, but they're wearing forced air. BSL 4 is where they should be at, biological safety level. We'll go over that if I haven't already. It should definitely be at BSL 4. Okay, so I mentioned the guy that died of Ebola uh, that caught it overseas. That was, uh, it was 2014, Thomas Eric Duncan was his name. He was evaluated in the um, ER and the emergency doctor diagnosed him with sinusitis, prescribed him some antibiotics and sent him home. Two days later, he came back to the hospital by ambulance. Condition had deteriorated and it was confirmed that he was infected with Ebola. He had just returned from Liberia and in the middle of the epidemic. September 15th, nine days before he showed up at the hospital in Dallas, he had helped transport an Ebola-stricken neighbor to a hospital in Liberia. Hospital continued to treat Duncan, but he died several days after being admitted. So the timeline is indicative of the life cycle of the Ebola virus. The incubation time for Ebola ranges from two to 21 days. All right, now some techniques, some methods, looking at the isolation culture and identification of viruses. Now, hopefully you could answer this first one right now. Okay, wait, I gotta... I had to mute that. All right, so hopefully you can already do this. Describe why viruses were originally described as filterable agents. Describe the cultivation of viruses and specimen collection and handling. Compare in vivo and vitro techniques used to cultivate viruses. All right, so they were filterable. Remember the uh, Ivanovsky and the Chamberlain, the Pasteur Chamberlain filter using a pore size of 0 0.2 microns. Or micrometers, you're able to separate virus out from, you know, a bunch of other miscellaneous colored balls here, bacteria or whatnot. And then if your pore size is up to five micrometers, you'll get bacteria and viruses coming through. So yeah, membrane filters can be used to remove cells or viruses from a solution. That's membranes uh, with smaller pore sizes. So you, this is a a method of sterilizing media as well. Sometimes you'll have fairly delicate biotics in your in your solution, so uh, you can't really autoclave it, uh, but instead you can filter it through a, well, with a smaller pore size than that, right? And uh, I've, I had to do that for a few experiments, and it was really, it was really painful because it took hours to get a liter of that stuff filtered oh wait no that was because i was i wasn't filtering it for sterilization i was using that filter to collect biomass that's why it took so long because i was pulling dna out of biomass and then yeah so that was oh well it worked out <laughs> okay so here are some flasks with a ph indicator in it uh, Eagle, Eagles Media, uh, Eagles Difco stuff. And long as it remains pinkish, red, reddish pink, and clear, uh, then your um, cell culture is likely not contaminated. But over here, these are phage. This is a lawn of bacteria that was then to which phage was added. And you see these clear circles are the plaques. They're called plaques. And that's where the bacteriophage is. So here's an increasing um, concentration of virus. 
So the viral titer uh, is increased here with the lowest here. So in vivo, in vitro, oh right. So the bacteriophages are, so you establish this lawn and then sometimes you can use soft auger. Soft, soft, there shouldn't be two softs there. Okay, soft auger that you can mix your phage solution in and pour over the top and then you gotta spin it out right quick. I'm not uh, a huge fan of that method, I gotta say. So in, so this is in vivo, I mean in vitro, sorry, these are in vitro. I guess that's in vivo, that's in the living organism. But eggs, chicken eggs are still very popular as a host for viruses. And uh, that's what Dr. Canning uses in his lab. Um, I don't think he's used any lately because he hasn't asked me to stop by the chicken plant to pick up any. So anyway, you can replicate virus in different parts, uh, various parts of the egg. And it's a picture showing that, that, yep. So that's definitely in vivo, right? So obviously we have to do this because we have to have a host cell to cultivate virus. It's part of the point here. All right, now for uh, cell cultures, we're looking at here, we have, um, so if you take uh, individual cells that you isolate from the tissue, in this case, lung tissue, you can start a primary cell culture. They will grow into a monolayer and then stop and they'll stay in uh, interphase or G naught because of contact inhibition. Normal cells don't overgrow themselves, right? And then you can take some of these and transfer them into a new medium and now you have a secondary cell culture. So these will presumably grow out to form a monolayer here. Now instead, if you have lung tissue that is uh, transformed or essentially cancerous. So one of the things a cancer cell has to be able to do is ignore contact inhibition. So this will allow you to establish a continuous cell line. They will continue to grow regardless of cell density. Oh, oh I do want to go back and mention that. So here, uh, most of the influenza vaccine uh, that's manufactured uh, for the annual flu vaccination programs uh, is cultured in hen's eggs, and that's redundant. Chicken eggs, or hen's eggs. But anyway, you need to grow these things up for other reasons too, uh, for identification and diagnosis of pathogenic viruses in clinical specimens and basic research studies. So there's a lot of reasons you want to cultivate viruses. Now looking at cell culture. Yeah, that's all I wanted to say about that. All right. So here is the, here's a multi-photon fluorescence image of Hella cells in culture. So we have a stain uh, showing the DNA. We have a stain showing microtubes and then Golgi apparatus. So Hella cells are cells that were in, obtained from Helen Lax. Hopefully most of you have heard of this by now. And she died of cervical cancer in 1951. Her family was given no option. Her husband was given no option to uh, approve of the use of her tissues. And uh, I, well, I don't know why. So the family was not aware until like 20 years later that her cells were, be, were still active and being used for research purposes. Though these have been pivotal in numerous research discoveries related to polio, cancer, um, and AIDS, among other diseases, her estate has never benefited from use of the cells um, although in 2013 the Lax family was given control over the publication of the genetic sequence of her cells. 
Okay, so uh, speaking of the effects of, does that have anything to do with this? Anyway, Hella cells can also be used to cultivate viruses, right? So when a cell is infected by viruses, there tend to be characteristic changes in the morphology of the cell. These are called cytopathic effects. Oh, right here, sorry. So CPE. So paramyxovirus uh, will tend to uh, cause, oh, here we go. We have syncytium and faint basophilic cytoplasmic inclusion bodies. So you can see inclusion bodies. The pox virus, e, uh, pink eosinophilic cytoplasmic inclusion bodies, cell swelling, herpes virus, uh, cytoplasmic stranding, and nuclear inclusion bodies, and adenovirus, uh, grape-like clusters, causing the arrangement to change too. That's also the point behind the uh, pap smear. You're looking for cells that have been altered. Okay, how much oh, do? Okay, so hemagglutination is one type of test that is used to detect viruses slash the presence of antibodies. So plenty of viruses will cause red blood cells or are able to bind red blood cells. So when you mix them together, you'll achieve hemagglutination in this little tube. Now this little tube is conical. So this little dot and this little dot, that's just where the cells fell down to the bottom of the conical tube, a little tiny well. If they all get clumped up though, they're not able to fall into the bottom like that. So they say kind of diffuse and spread out. It seems counterintuitive, at least it did to me. So uh, red blood cells with themselves, with nothing. So this is a control, no reaction. So all the cells will settle down at the bottom of the well. Uh, viruses, you add viruses to the red blood cells, hemagglutination, so it'll stay diffuse. And then if there are antibodies present that are um, able to bind the virus and they're in sufficient quantities, there's a whole issue of concentration here, the antibodies can bind up the viruses and the red blood cells can fall to the bottom. And this would be a positive result for antibodies, but by not showing hemagglutination. So this is a method that we can use to identify a specific virus. This is an indirect approach. So in the example with the guy with the rabies, the uh, ongoing clinical thing, uh, that's why they use that. Finding the specific, the virus itself is difficult but finding the antibodies that react to the virus is a lot less difficult. So hemagglutinin inhibition, that's what this phenomena is called right here. So we also can do nucleic acid amplification test, which they're calling NAT, and that's polymerase chain reaction. Uh, we can do reverse transcriptase PCR uh, to detect the presence of RNA viruses, that's one way. The enzyme immunoassay, which I've gone over before. So again, you have the positive sample um, where you have virus, the antibody is able to bind. Uh, so it's bringing its enzyme with it and that causes fluorescence. Here with no antibody, uh, I mean, sorry, with no virus to bind, the antibody cannot bind. So the fluorochromes are washed away. So there's no color reaction. So that's enzyme immunoassay. And that is the same principle the pregnancy test, right, is based on. So influenza, so influenza is named more specifically based on the type of neuraminidase, and that's NA, and that's this little green golf tee looking thing. And uh, so that's NA. And hemagglutinin is HA, which is this glob top thing here. And like the H1N1, uh, as I mentioned in the first section, I was responsible for the pandemic in 1918 and 2009. And the current uh, most prevalent strain is H1N1, I believe. H2N2 for 1957, H3N2 for the pandemic in 1968.
So it's these uh, stalks, spikes that are that enable the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase to bind to the host cell and get endocytosed, starting its infection cycle. The current work on a universal flu vaccine, um, I attended a seminar, that's a lot of years ago now, so I guess they haven't like busted through and sorted that out. But the idea, so this head, so the hemagglutinin head here, this is like three domains, um, the repeated domains, I don't know, something like that. Here's, there's a lot of variance in um, the majority of the service. But the stalk is highly conserved. The idea is to create a vaccine that will create antibodies that will target the stalk. And that should make it work against every uh, influenza virus. So that's the direction we're supposed to be going. So some other viral pathogens. I'm not going to go over this. I'm not going to make you all memorize. I had to memorize the major viral families and examples of each, but... I don't know. I don't know what the utility of that really is. Okay, so part three, clinical focus. We have real-time PCR, or, or sorry, reverse transcriptase PCR, um, viral cultivation, didn't cultivate virus from saliva, which is not surprising. All right, so section four, I guess we'll wait for that. There's only five minutes left. Can I get? Th I can get through it in five minutes. So describe viroids and their unique characteristics, virusoids, and prions. So viroids. Uh, here's an example: potato spindle tuber viroid. Uh, a viroid is a short strand of circular RNA capable of self-replication. Has no protein coat. Virusoid. A satellite RNA, single-stranded RNA, uh, these require other viruses to co-infect simultaneously, hepatitis delta being one of these. So again, viroid, this is free, free RNA that is capable of self-replication. That's a viroid. Prions, oh sorry, that's viroids and virusoids. Prions are basically chaperone proteins like heat shock proteins that instead of repairing proteins to their original conformation uh, turn them into other prions so they can be spontaneously generated and uh, so you have endogenous PRPC interacts with a prion uh, the prion converts it into a another prion. So endogenous normal prion protein is converted into disease-causing form when it encounters this variant form of the protein. So it can um, arise spontaneously, especially if a mutant form of the protein is present, or it may originate from misfolded prions consumed in food, like brain tissue, which is... It can be food in the South. You can still find it on shelves, pork brains. Um, just make sure you cook it, I guess. My mom said it was one of her favorites was scrambled eggs and brains with ketchup. I haven't tried it. That was like one of the creepiest parts of uh, what Temple of Doom, right? The chilled monkey brains. Anyway, Crestfield Jacob disease is an example. Uh, here's a normal brain compared to one with Crestfield Jacob. And so sponge like lesions form throughout. Uh, this can take, it's called Kuru uh, in one South Pacific population uh, where it was tradition to consume one's ancestors brain tissue. Uh, some of it. I don't think they ate the whole thing. Maybe they did. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. Prion disease. We have it here uh, in deer. Uh, here's, here we go. Here's some examples. This is okay. This one's thought to be somatic mutation, sporadic uh, Crestfield Jacob disease. This is all different types of transmissible spongiform encephalitis in humans. Uh, here's a variant, uh, familial, latrogenic, contaminated neurosurgical instruments, corneal graft, ouch. 
Kuru, eating infected meat through ritualistic cannibalism. And here's a couple of other ones, yeah. All right, resolution. So David uh, recovered is the TLDR here. So the rabies immunoglobulin injections, the rabies shots, uh, it attaches and it activates any rabies virus that may be present. Um, and he got four rabies specific vaccination, vaccinations in his arms and he recovered. Uh, rabies is usually fatal once a patient starts to exhibit symptoms and post bite treatments are mainly palliative. So sedation and pain management. So this was um, this last January, January 2018. That's, I told you about that um, six year old scratched by sick bat. The dad left the six year old alone with the bat in a bucket. All right, uh, that brings us to the end of chapter six. I will make the assignment available. We are at the end of our 40 minute, 50 minutes anyway. So yeah, I'll see y'all on Wednesday. Okay, and I don't have a fun sign off yet. I probably never will. All right, have fun.